God wants us to understand that there are two parts to the Day of Atonement, beginning and end. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. The head of Satan being crushed, does it happen at the beginning of the Day of Atonement or the end of the Day of Atonement? How do I know? The Bible says so. What book of the Bible? Leviticus. What chapter of the Bible? Let's turn it. Thank you for showing us that the devil is nothing, that you are strong. We thank you for even letting it happen. Lord, I ask you to do something. Just like Elijah, I ask you to do something to let us know that this is no joke. Please be with us in these last moments in the, or in the rest of this study. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. I pray, you know, Elijah, Elijah prayed that Israel will wake up. You know, Elijah didn't not only pray for it to rain, Elijah prayed for it to stop raining. You read it in, in, in 1 Kings. The Bible says so. You read it in James. The Bible says so. Elijah prayed that it would stop raining so that Israel's attention could be received that what they were doing was nothing normal. It was serious. Brothers and sisters, you must understand that God is trying to get our attention before it is too late. Something is going on. Look what the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Leviticus 16. Beginning in verse 20, let's pick up together, together Leviticus 16 and verse 20. If you'll put the stream back on for me, brother, as we're turning, would you, would you sit all this back up for us? Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16, beginning in verse 20. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. The Bible says, and when he hath made an... Amen. This is not the beginning of the Day of Atonement. This is the... Amen. When he hath made an end of, the, of, of reconciling the holy place, that is the most holy... And the tabernacle of the congregation, that is the holy place, and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands, where? Upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him, how much? All the iniquities of the children of Israel, all their transgressions, all their what? We found out, we remember, that is the type of the sinless generation. That sinless generation that's going to be alive on the day of atonement. Now, let's continue. The Bible says, putting them upon the head of the goat, verse 21, last part, and shall send him away by the hand of what? A fit man until the wilderness. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. Does that happen at the beginning of the Day of Atonement or does that happen at the end of the Day of Atonement? So then we need to be able to find out how do we know the difference between the beginning of the Day of Atonement and the end of the Day of Atonement? Well, first, we must understand that the Day of Atonement has two parts. How many parts? Now, in the shadow, it had a beginning and an end, an evening and a morning, first, last. But in the antitype, it has two parts as well. Let's see what the two parts are. Go in your Bible to the book of Acts, chapter 10, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. You're going to Acts, chapter 10, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We want to read this together. Now, notice what the Bible says. First, a first angel is sent to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, and he says something with a loud voice. Anybody know what he says with a loud voice? What does the first angel's message say? Fear God and give what? Glory to him. Why? For the hour of his judgment is... Now, it, it looked like some of you didn't know that. Let me make sure you know that. I don't want to go over that if you didn't know that. Now, does the Bible say that? Where would I find what we just quoted in the Bible before we read in Acts 10? Let's go there. Let's go there quickly. Revelation 14. Let me make sure we see that. Revelation 14. Last book of the Bible. Revelation 14. Beginning in verse 6, let's read Revelation 14, verse 6 together. What does the Bible say in verse 6? The Bible says, And I saw another angel do what? Fly in the midst of heaven, having what, everybody? Everlasting gospel. What is he going to do with that gospel? Preach unto them that dwell on the earth. How many people? Every nation. Does it include America, yes or no? Does it include Samoa, yes or no? It says every nation, what else? Kindred, what else? Tongue, what else? People. It's a worldwide message. 
Well, it's a message at the end of time. Well, what is the message? Verse 7. What does the message say? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give what? And give glory to him. Why? For the hour or time of his judgment is come. Not coming, it's taking place. So that message says that at the end of time, there's going to be a worldwide judgment that's going to take place at the end. And in this judgment, brothers and sisters, that takes place, when did the judgment start? October 22nd, when? 1844. Jesus went into the most holy place on the day of atonement. Now, I want to ask you a question. How many parts does the judgment have? Two parts, just like the type, just like the day of atonement. Well, what are the two parts of the judgment? Go back to Acts chapter 10. Go to Acts chapter 10, and now we'll let the Bible explain itself. In Acts chapter 10, the Bible tells us that there are two parts. Acts chapter 10, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Let's read verse 42 together. What does the Bible say in verse 42? And he commanded us to do what? Preach unto the people. And to testify that it was he which was ordained of God to be the... Now, remember, there's a worldwide judgment. Now, he's going to be the judge of what? Now, if you don't get it, it's okay. If you don't get it, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. If you don't get it, it's okay. If it doesn't, if it doesn't do it this time, it's okay. Basically, just try one more time. If you don't go, it's okay. All right. So, the Bible says in Acts 10 that he will be the judge of two parts. What does the Bible say? He'll be the judge of what? Of the quick, number one, and what else? The quick and... The dead. Now, did, I, did the Bible say that? I can't hear you. Did the Bible say that? Question. What does quick mean? Does it mean that the man runs really fast? What does quick mean? A person that is alive. So the Bible is saying he is the judge of not only the dead, but he's the judge of what? The living. The quick and the dead. This is what the Bible means when it says the word of God is quick and powerful. The word of God has life. Man should not live by bread alone. How should he live? He shall live or have life by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So my brothers and sisters, there are two parts to the judgment. What are the two parts of the judgment? The judgment of the dead and the judgment of the living. Let's say it together. How many parts? What are the two parts? Judgment of the? And judgment of the? I can't hear you. Judgment of the? And judgment of the? Now, why are there two parts? Because remember, everything that happens in type must happen in any type. In the type, there were two parts. What were the two parts? Evening, morning. Beginning and end. So my brothers and sisters, question. If God has two parts to judge the quick living and the dead, then both of those must happen before the day of atonement can come to an end. And it has to happen on time. Now, I want to ask you a question. Which one comes first? Judgment of the quick living or judgment of the dead? How do you know that the judgment of the dead, because the Bible says quick living and dead. He's the judge of the quick living and the dead. So the Bible says he's the judge of the living and the dead. So how do you know that the judgment doesn't start with the living and not the dead? How do you know that? Because if you believe something as a seven evidence, everything you believe should come from where? Where should it come from? From the Bible. How do you know that judgment starts with the dead? What text? Now you know what happened. Can you imagine? Can you imagine we're doing evangelism? We come to the member of the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints. We come to the member of the uh, Jehovah's Witness. We come to the, the Methodists. And he says, well, how do you believe this? We say, I know it so. It's true. This is what's going to happen. How do you know? And then we look at him. Uh, uh, I don't, my church says. You think that's going to win a soul? We've got to be able to understand this for the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, notice what the Bible says. Let's go in our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. What did I say? 
We're going to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We know the judgment has two parts, the dead and the living. How do we know which part first? You're going to 1 Thessalonians 4, and when you get there, if you'll let me know by saying amen. 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning in verse 16. We're very familiar with this verse, but sometimes we don't understand the depth of the verse. Let's read this together in 1 Thessalonians 4, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. I want to ask you a question. Those that are saved and pass the judgment, the priest awards them a reward. You remember, after the judgment is over, the priest stands up and says something. He says, him that is unjust, let him be what? Unjust still. Him that is filthy, let him be what? Filthy still. Him that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And him that is what? Holy, let him be what? That's made when probation closes. The priest stops his work. And then it says, behold, I come how? Quickly. And my, what's the next word? My reward is what? With me to give unto every man according as his works shall be. So the priest after he finishes the judgment, he comes into the most holy, uh, to the outer court and he puts a blessing on the congregation. Those that became sinless, he puts a blessing on them. What blessing is the reward that the priest brings with him to those that have gone through the plan of redemption? Somebody talk to me. He that believes in me shall have what? Everlasting life. So what blessing is conferred upon the congregation that becomes sinless? Everlasting life. So what reward does the priest bring with him? Everlasting life. Now, my brother and sister, I want to ask you a question. Who gets it first? Because listen, whoever is judged first gets it first. Whoever is judged first gets the reward first. Who gets the reward first? Someone says, I don't know. Well, what does the text say? Look what it says in verse 16. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. What is the Bible saying? For the Lord himself shall do what? Shall descend from heaven how? With a shout. What else? With a voice singing. What else? What else? And the dead in Christ shall rise. So who gets the reward first? So then who is judged first? Then what does the Bible say? Then what does the text say? Go to look at the text. What does the text say? Then we which are living and remain shall be what? Caught up. And so shall we meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the reward. We celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles a thousand years. My brothers and sisters, that tells me the one who receives the reward first is the dead. Who's judged first? Dead. Who's judged next? Living. Is the Bible deep? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, go to Revelation 20. Go to Revelation 20. Look at Revelation 20. The Bible says when the judgment is set, the books open. Revelation chapter 20, and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. Revelation chapter 20, notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 20. Revelation 20, verse 20. When you get there, let me know by saying amen. Let's read that together. The Bible says, and I saw what? We're in Revelation 20. I don't hear you. Revelation 20. I'm going to wait for you to get there. Revelation 20, verse 12. Revelation 20, verse 12, please, don't look at me, read the Bible. Revelation 20, verse 12, what does the Bible say? And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were stopped. This is the opening, the beginning. It says, and another book was opened, which is the book of, and the dead were, my brothers and sisters, who is judged first? Who is judged first? The dead. And then who is judged last? So in 1844, when Jesus began the work of atonement or the work of the investigative judgment, who did he start with in the beginning of the day of atonement? He started with the what, everybody? He started the judgment with the dead. Question. Can the day of atonement end while he's still judging the dead? I'm asking you a question. Can the Day of Atonement end while he's still judging the dead? Remember now, the Day of Atonement has two parts. Judging the dead is like evening, the beginning. Judging the living is like what? Morning, the end. Remember? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. 
in the great getting up morning very well, very well. We call it the resurrection, not night. We call it the resurrection what? Morning. That's the end. My brothers and sisters, God starts with the judgment of the dead, but inspiration says soon. None know how soon Jesus will come to the cases of the living. In other words, no one will be able to give a date as to when judgment will pass from the dead to the living. But guess what? God has told us of the event. So my question tonight is, what event happens on earth to reveal the fact that judgment has passed from the dead to the living. You're going to find out that this is why when the national Sunday law passes on earth, you're going to find out it's going to be too late for seven-day Adventists to get ready. We're going to show you that. Now, my brothers and sisters, how do I know? Does the Bible tell us that we can know when the judgment will pass, yes or no? Yes. The Bible says that we can know the time. The Bible gives evidence after evidence to tell us. In fact, go to James chapter 2. Go to James chapter 2 and let's notice for a moment how we can know what are the events surrounding the judgment of the living. Go to James chapter 2 and when you get there, let me know by saying amen. We're going to James chapter 2. Notice what the Bible says in James 2 beginning in verse 12. James chapter 2 beginning in verse 12. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say in verse 12? Are you there, Amen. What does the Bible say in verse 12? So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged. So what's going to judge us in the judgment? What's going to test us in the judgment? I can't hear you. What? So then when the dead are judged, they're going to be tested by the law. When the living are judged, the living are going to be tested by the... So then when judgment passes from the dead to the living, something must test the living concerning the law of God. I wonder what it is. Look at verse 10. Look at verse 10. What does verse 10 say? The Bible says, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend where? And one point is what? So the Bible is telling us that God can test us on one point of the law, and if we fail it, then it shows us if we are in harmony with the entire law. Am I right? I wonder what the one point of the law is that God is going to judge the living by when judgment passes from the dead to the living. I wonder what the one point is. Is there ever been one point of the law of the Ten Commandments in which God has judged his people on? Yes or no? What point? What commandment of all ten are the heart of the commandments that God uses to prove whether we'll keep the entire law? The fourth commandment. What does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day. Now, the only commandment that starts with remember is the one we chose to forget. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. But the, but the seventh day is what? Is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Not seven heaven is Sabbath. It's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Now, remember my friend I told you I met at the, air, uh, at the airport, or not airport, but at the hotel? I saw him today. came to me. He said, smile, we greet it as brothers. He's a part of the church of the Latter-day Saints. And we talked about this very point. We talked about understanding this in the last days. We talked about the Sabbath. And I said, now, if we're true followers of God, we should be in harmony with all the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, the fourth with all the rest. He said, that's true. I said, but what does the fourth commandment say? Remember the Sabbath day. The seventh day is the Sabbath. I said the Sabbath, seventh day is not Sunday. The seventh day is what? Sunday is the first day. Every Christian will tell you that. Now, he starts getting confused when you bring him to this point, but he'll tell you that from the beginning. You say, what day did Jesus rise from the grave? And they'll say, Easter Sunday, first day of the week. 
Then you show him the seventh day Sabbath and he forgets now what that is. Now, my brothers and sisters, when I came back and I showed them this, I said, look, every one of us can be children of God. And if we love God, it doesn't matter what our church is. We want to follow Jesus more than a church, more than tradition. I told him to bring me the text because he said, I think it's in the Bible. I said, well, bring me the text. You're a missionary. You know, bring me the text that showed that Sunday is the Sabbath. And today I saw him. Guess what he said to me? He said, I couldn't find the text last night. Can you give me another day? I'll give him a thousand days. He won't be able to find it. My brothers and sisters, why? It's not in the Bible. You know, normally when we go around the world, I normally offer a person $10,000 to find the text that says that Sunday is the Sabbath. $10,000 for anybody that can show me from the Bible that God changed the day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. That God changed it from the first day to the, from the seven days to the first day. And I don't have that money in my bank account, but I'm not afraid. You know why? It's not in the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We're not going to worry about it no more. It's okay. Thank you, thank you. It's okay. My, my, it's okay. It's all right. We, we, it's all right. We're going to let, we're gonna, we're gonna let the Holy Spirit teach us. Now, my brothers and sisters, so that tells me, when I told the man that, he said, I'm going to come back. I said, it's all right. I'll still be here by the grace of God, and we'll study some more. Do you know that God has sheep in every denomination? Do you know that we're told that the majority of true Christians are not in the Seventh Adventist Church? The majority of true Christians are in the Catholic Church. They're in the Congregational Church. They're in the Methodist Church. They're in the Baptist Church. They're in the Church of Latter-day Saints. They're in all these other churches that they've never heard the truth, but they're God's children, and when they hear it, they're going to follow. And yet, some of the greatest devils and the way that you know who a man is, if he's a real child of God, is not by religious denomination or church affiliation. God knows his children because whatever the master says, whatever the shepherd says, whatever the voice of Jesus says, they say, yes, Lord, I will follow. And if a man's a member of the church of Christ, if a man's an atheist or a Gnostic, or the man's a Buddhist or a Muslim, but he'll be willing to follow the word of God, that person will become uh, the, 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 the into the remnant church because the religion of God is the religion of the Bible. And the religion of the Bible is seven-day Adventism. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. But brothers and sisters, if you are seven-day Adventists, you won't follow what the word of God says because of tradition of seven-day Adventists. You just hold on to your church, you're going to be lost. The only way that God knows where he is, they're willing to follow him. Now, my brothers and sisters, there is going to come a final test at the end of time. Notice what the Bible says it has always been. Go to Exodus chapter 16. What book did I say? Now, the Bible says when judgment passes to, from the dead to the living, we're going to be tested by the law. And it doesn't have to be the entire law. The Bible says that we're tested on one point. If we're guilty of offending one, we're really guilty of how much? All. Oh. Now, my brothers and sisters, we want to find out, does the Bible tell us that there was a particular point that God has tested his people on throughout history? Notice what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 16. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. amen. Exodus 16, beginning in verse 4. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 16, verse 4. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will reign from heaven from you. And the people shall go out and gather how much? A certain rate, how many days? Every day, but not really every day. We're going to find out it was every day, but except for a certain day. It says, now why did God rain that bread from heaven? Why did God do this? Look at the last line. Now remember, it's not really for Moses. It's really talking about the plan of redemption. Now watch. It says that I may, what's the next word? Now, do you know what the word prove means? Anybody know what the word prove means? What does the word prove mean? Test. So he says, I want to probe. I want to test. I want to see who are those that will keep the commandments of God. And the Bible says that I may prove them whether they will do what? I can't hear you. We're reading Exodus 16 and verse 4. Last line. It says... I will prove them whether they will what? Walk in my law or what? In other words, he's going to test them whether they're going to keep his law 
or what? Or not? Now, my brothers and sisters, how did he test them concerning how they were going to keep the law? What was his test? Look what the Bible says. Go to 23. Exodus 16, verse 23. Go to verse 23. The Bible says, and he said unto them, this is that which the Lord has said. Tomorrow is the rest of what? I don't hear you. Tomorrow is the rest of what? Now we see the Holy Sabbath coming. It says tomorrow is the rest. Now question, what day is the Holy Sabbath? What day is that? Seven day. So it says tomorrow is the rest of the Holy Sabbath. Be, be, uh, 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 Holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake that which you will bake today. See that which you will see. That which remain of lay up for you to be kept until the morning. Verse 25. And Moses said what? Eat that today. For today is the Sabbath unto the Lord. Today you shall not find it in the field. Verse 26. Now come on. What, what is the verse? I want to make sure you see it from the Bible. What does verse 26 say? Six days shall you gather it. But on the seventh day, which is the Sabbath day. What did God do? For six days, God rained manna. But on the sixth day, he rained the double portion. Because on the seventh day, he wasn't going to send anything. Why? Because the seventh-day Sabbath is God's special day of rest. So the Bible says, look what it says. Let's continue. It says, you shall not find any. This is a Sabbath. In it, there shall be none. Verse 27. And it came to pass that there went out some of the people on the seventh day for to gather, and they found and the Lord said unto Moses, How long refuse you to keep what? My commandments and law. Question, what was the test whether they would keep the whole law or not? God used one point. What was the point? What was the point? Talk to me. I want to ask you a question. Someone says, but that was Israel. That's the Old Testament. That was the children of Israel in the Old Testament. That's how he tested them. That's how he proved them. But what does the New Testament say? Let's go. 1 Corinthians 10. Go to 1 Corinthians 10. Do you know that the Bible says in the New Testament that this test that God put on them was a sign for the last days? Look at 1 Corinthians 10. And when you get there, let me know by saying amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible is concerning the wandering of the children of Israel through the wilderness. In 1 Corinthians 10 verse 2, the Bible says, And we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud, and where else? Talking about the Red Sea. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6. Verse 6. What does verse 6 say? Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not what? Lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Who was this that lusted? The children of what? But now watch, verse 10, verse 11, verse 11. Now, what's the next word? Not some of these things, but how much? Does that include the testing of them by the manna, yes or no? It says, now all these things happen unto them for, give me another name, shadows, types, examples. And they are written for our admonition or warnings upon who? Upon whom the? Not the beginning of the world, but the? So my brothers and sisters, at the end of time, when judgment passes from the beginning of the day of atonement to the end of the day of atonement, what is going to be the test of the law that shows that judgment has passed from the dead to the living? The passing of a decree. What decree? Talk to me. When the national son in law passes on earth, that is a signal that judgment has passed from the dead to the living. From the what? Has the judgment passed from the dead to the living yet? Yes or no? Not yet. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means in 2020, God is still judging the what? Can the day of atonement end while he's judging the dead? So what would happen if we got to the 6,000 years and he was still judging the dead? 
Satan would win the great controversy. So my brothers and sisters, before the 6,000 year period, what must happen on earth to bring Jesus to the end of the day of atonement? Judgment must pass from the dead to the living. How? By the passing of a what? National Sunday law decree that will judge God's people, that will test God's people, that will close probation for God's people. Now, do you know what the word probation means? The word probation only means what? Proving. And the final test over the seal of God and the mark of the beast, over the true seven-day Sabbath of creation, or the false Sunday Sabbath of tradition, that test will bring about the transfer or the change from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living. Question, in the type, did they know when judgment passed from the dead to the living, yes or no? In the type, in the shadow, did they know when judgment passed from the dead to the living? Yes. How did they know? Let's look at the shadow. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to bring this message to a close, show us, if ever there was a time to get ready, it's now. Show us, Lord, that the day of atonement is about to come to an end and you want us to be ready. Please, dear God, in these last few minutes, in Jesus' name, amen. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus 28. What book did I say? Go to Exodus 28. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 28. Now, my brothers and sisters, I want you to see this from the Bible. Now, notice, now anybody knows the priest in the sanctuary, he couldn't wear whatever he wanted. The priest had to wear the holy garments that the God himself dictated for the priest to wear. Now, on the Day of Atonement, guess what the priest had on the bottom of his garment and on the Day of Atonement? He had something on the bottom of his garment. He had something that was called a bell and a pomegranate. How do I know? Look at Exodus 28. And when you get there, let me know by saying Amen. Exodus chapter 28, look what the Bible says in verse 2. In Exodus 28, verse 2, the Bible says, And thou shalt make what? Holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. Question, was Jesus concerned about how his ministers dressed, yes or no? So much so, he didn't let them make a fashion. He told them specifically details of what their dress should look like. Look at the next verse. Notice what the Bible says in verse 3. It says, And thou shalt speak all that are to a wise hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they should make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may what? So anybody that was to serve for God, their dress was dictated by God himself, and if they did not wear the dress that God told them to wear, the Bible says they were put out of the sanctuary. I wonder if dress still matters today. I wonder if dress still matters today. Now, my brothers and sisters, that priest had dressed for glory and for beauty. The minister, now notice what his dress looked like, particularly the priest. Look at what the Bible says in Exodus 28, beginning in verse 34, 33. Exodus 28, verse 33, still talking about the priest's garment. It says, and beneath upon the what? What is the hymn? What is the hymn? What does that mean? The hymn. The hymn is that bottom part that is folded together. It says, upon the hem of it, thou shalt make what? Pomegranates. Jump down to verse 34. In fact, I can imagine, can you imagine seeing a lava lava with a pomegranate on the bottom of it? Look what it says. In Exodus 28, verse 34, let's read verse 34 together. It says, let's read it together, a what? A golden bell and a pomegranate. A golden bell and a what? Now, why does the Bible repeat it? Anytime the Bible repeats something, it's most important. And so on the priest's garment, what was on the priest's garment? A bell and a... Now, time will not allow me to explain the pomegranate today. But I will tell you this. A minister must have more than sounds. He must have some fruit in his life. He can't just be a preacher. He's got to practice what he preaches. But that's another study. I'm talking tonight about the bell. He had a what on the bottom of his garment? A what? Bell. Now, my brothers and sisters, what was the bell for on the bottom of his garment? What was it for? The Bible tells us. Let's see. In verse 35, it says, And it shall be upon Aaron, what for? 
Give me another name for minister. Give me another name for minister. To serve. Give me another name to serve. As he did his what? His work. So as the priest worked, as he ministered. Is that right, Elder? Elder. As the priest worked and ministered, something was going on, something very serious. It says, as the priest worked and ministered, look what happened. The Bible says, Heavenly Father, please don't let any of us be distracted. Father, this is so serious. Please, dear God, in these last moments, help us to see that the most solemn event of the ages is about to take place and not one of us is ready. Not pastors, not elders, not members, not persons, not even me speaking, Lord, I need Jesus. Please, dear God, Humble us so that we may hear you before it is too late. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to tell you something. How can we come to church and be so careless? I don't care who we are. Jesus is coming. Probation is closing. Do you see tonight the devil's not playing? You think that the devil just put the light out for no reason. He thought that was going to stop the meeting. Did it stop the meeting? He thought that sending rain was going to stop the meeting. Did it stop the meeting? He thought that, 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 that saying that if you stay out late, it's going to stop the meeting. Did it stop the meeting? The devil will do anything to try to stop you from, and I from hearing this message, understanding this message, and getting ready. He understands that time is running out. His very existence is at stake. His head is about to be crushed. And his whole plan is to keep Jesus from coming to the most holy place. Now, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says... That when that priest had the bell in his garment, it meant something. In Exodus 28, verse 35, verse 35 says, And it shall be upon Aaron to minister, <clears throat> and his sound shall be what? So the bell allowed his sound to be what? Now before you read on, look at me for a moment. So that meant that the priest had a bell on the bottom of his garment, and that bell had a sound that could be what? And it can be heard so that when the priest moved, what happened? You can hear the bell. If the priest stopped moving, what happened? So they knew if the priest was moving based on the sound. So if the bell moved, they knew the priest moved. But now I want you to see there were two main times of the movement of the bells. How many? Watch. Let's read. The Bible says... That is, verse 35, and, and that his sound shall be heard when he does what? When he goeth into the holy place before the Lord, and when he does what? So two times, when he goes in, and when he comes. Now, when does he go in, at the end or the beginning? So a sound is heard when he begins the day of atonement, and a sound is heard as he's getting ready to what? In the day of atonement, beginning and end, two parts. What are the two parts of the judgment? Judgment of the dead, judgment of the... Now I want to ask you a question. Did Jesus announce the judgment of the dead, yes or no? Yes. Who announced the judgment of the dead? You know what we call them? Adventists. You ever heard of William Miller? He was a farmer. He was a Baptist. You ever heard of Joseph, uh, Joseph Bates? You ever heard of... Uh, James White, he was a Methodist. You ever heard of Sister Ellen Harmon? She was a Methodist. But they heard the bell. You say, what do I mean? Now, my brothers and sisters, if you understand, you will know that, remember, in the sanctuary, types were being fulfilled. Now, do you know that on the Day of Atonement, the Day of Atonement, what day was the Day of Atonement? The Day of Atonement was what? Tenth day of what? But do you know that there was a feast before the sixth feast? There was a fifth feast. Anybody know what the fifth feast was just before the Day of Atonement? The Feast of... Anybody know what day the Feast of Trumpets was on? The Feast of Trumpets was on the first day of the seventh month. That's in Leviticus 23, your homework. How many days before the Day of Atonement? Now, that's why the ten days of prayer was significant. Ten days to Jesus is always a time of preparation. Do you remember that Jesus was on the earth after his resurrection? 40 days. But Pentecost came 50 days after. So after he left 40 days, how many days they have left? 10. 
10 days to prepare for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So my brothers and sisters, 10 days. But in Bible prophecy, a day is a year. So my brothers and sisters, what day was the Day of Atonement? 18 what? So 10 days or 10 years prior to the Day of Atonement, the Feast of Trumpets was to start. What is three 10 years before 1844? 1834. Something happened. In 1833, November, the stars did what? Fail. And when the stars fell, that was one of the last signs. What year did the stars fall? What year? Now remember, these types must be fulfilled at the time pointed out in the shadow. So my brothers and sisters, 1833, the stars fell. William Miller had been studying it for two years, since 1831. He saw it. He said that was the last of the signs before we see the, the heavens open up. And so he started preaching. And everybody that started accepting his preaching of Daniel and Revelation, even though that they were from different churches, they were Baptists and Congregationists and Methodists and other Christians, but brothers and sisters, some of them not even going to church, but when they accepted the message, they became called Adventists. What does the word Adventist mean? Adventist is a Latin word that only means, guess what? The coming of the Lord. It means what? So the first Advent. The first coming of Christ. So an Adventist is one who believes in the second coming of Christ. Do you know that every Christian church should be Adventist? See, our religion is just the religion of the Bible. Now, my brothers and sisters, Adventists came on the scene in 1834, right on time, pointed out in the sanctuary service, just as Jesus was pointed out. 14 day, first month, 31 AD, Passover lamb, Jesus, the Messiah, pointed out the same sanctuary points out the Adventist church. What other church came on the scene, 1834, preaching about this? No other church in the world. You can study history and find this out. Now, my brothers and sisters, when they start preaching, you know, on the Feast of Trumpets, what they would do, they would take trumpets and they would blow it and they would say, in just 10 days, the Day of Atonement is coming. But in the antitypical day of atonement, it wasn't a literal trumpet. It was an antitypical trumpet. You know what the Bible says in Isaiah 58, verse 1? It says, lift up your voice like a trumpet. So my brothers and sisters, they fulfilled the antitypical feast of trumpets by lifting their voices, proclaiming that in 10 years that there was going to be a coming of Christ. Did it happen historically, yes or no? Did Jesus come? Yes, he did. He didn't come to the earth, though. Jesus came to the Ancient of Days. He came to the Most Holy Place. Jesus moved from the Holy Place where? To the Most Holy Place. The bell went off. They heard the priest go in. But that was the beginning of the Day of Atonement. But brothers and sisters, the Day of Atonement has to come to an end. So when the priest is getting ready to end the Day of Atonement, he has to start judging the what? The living. He starts with the dead every successive generation. Who is the first person that's judged? Who is the first person? Someone said Adam. No, no. Someone said not Adam. Adam, remember now, the dead are judged first. Adam didn't die first. You know who died first? Abel. You know the first person going to be judged? Abel. So if you read in the New Testament, Jesus in Matthew 23 said, from the blood, not of Adam, but from the blood of righteous Abel, all the blood has been slain of the prophets. So my brothers and sisters, the first person judged Abel. Then every generation, and Jesus is going to proceed from every generation succeeding one after another until he gets to the final generation, and the final generation are not dead, the final generation are And when Jesus passes, from the judgment of the dead to the judgment of the living, what happens on the bells? Talk to me. A bell rings. And those who are seven Adventists, those who believe the Bible, guess what? They hear the sound of the bell. And they know that Jesus has passed from the dead to the living. Question. Is it a literal bell? Yes or no? No. There is no bell large enough or loud enough that can ring from heaven and earth. The antitypical bell is a knowledge of the prophecies. Do you know that the word bell comes from a word that means clock? I'm going to show you tomorrow night. 
Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the great clock of time is the bell that sounds, that shows us where Jesus is and what Jesus is doing, and that the work now is that Jesus is judging the living. Question, who is the first person that's going to get judged when the Sunday laws pass? The Baptist? 1 Peter 4.17 says that judgment will begin where? At the house of God. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when the National Sunday Laws pass, the first person tested is the Seventh-day Adventist. And when the judgment passes from the dead to the living, guess what? We must not be getting ready. We must be ready. How do I know? Fear God. Give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is... So when the hour of judgment is come, not only for the dead, but when it's come for the living... The living must be in a position where they're giving God glory. Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. So when the living's judgment come, we must be in a position already where we're giving God glory. Question, can I give glory to God and sin at the same time? How do I know? All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So sin does not give God glory. Sin comes short of giving God glory. So when the judgment of the living comes, I must be in a position of sinlessness where I can give glory to God. Can I do this by myself? What is our only hope of getting back to this sinless condition? The Bible says, Christ in you. Not Christ outside of you. It says, Christ not knocking at the door of your hearts. It says, Christ where? In you is what? The hope of glory. The only hope of glorifying God and being brought back to the sin. We need Jesus. But guess what? In order to get Jesus, it takes what? Time. Are you willing to give him time, yes or no? There are three things that must happen. We're not going to study it tonight. I'm going to let you go home. But I want to tell you this before we, before we close and go home. How many things? I've been giving you sets of threes. This is a new set of three. God does things in threes. The Godhead in three. Out of court, holy place, and what else? Most holy place. Now, out of court here, holy place here, most holy place here, getting to know God, steps of three. What's the first step? Know and understand the? Second step, know what to? And we can become the? Friend of God, if we do what he says. But here's another set of three. If we're going to get to know God, number one, we need to do what? I can't hear you. We need to do what? I'm going to write it on the board and I want you to tell me. Number one, we need to do, do what? Number two, we need to do what? Clean up. Number three, we need to do what? Stand what? Three things. What's the first? Wake up. What's the second? Clean up. What's the third? Stand up. Then we'll know God. In the outer court, we wake up. Enough. You know the time. You understand what to do. You sense your need. You awake. You can say, Lord, I need Jesus. What should you do once you wake up? Once you wake up, next thing, go into the holy place and do what? It's time to start cleaning up. Lord, what is in my life that needs to what? Come out. Clean it up. That work starts in the holy place, but it finishes in the most holy place on the cleansing of the sanctuary on the day of atonement. God begins to clean out everything that needs to stand out or come out of our life that's not in harmony with the word of God. You know, there's some music that needs to be cleaned up. There's some DVDs in your house that need to be cleaned up tonight. Music, trash, CDs, clothes, food. There are some changes that have to be made. Once we wake up, my young brother, my young brother, I don't know if this is your first night. Would you tap that young brother behind you? Would you tap him? I'm, I'm talking to you. In here, we're listening. This is serious. Our life is on the line. Jesus is coming. And my brothers and sisters, what God is going to tell us, the first thing that has to happen 
God has to wake us up. You see, if we can talk while God is talking, we're sleeping. And we dare. See, God needs ministers that's going to help us understand this is no joke. This is for real. If you're on the street, the man on the street would say, who are you talking to? Do you know that in God's church, God needs ministers that will not be cowards, that will show us that God wants to save us, but at first, he has to wake us up. Then he has to what? Clean us up. Then guess what? He can stand us up. My brothers and sisters, I want to wake up. What do you say? But the first work of waking up, none of us can do for ourselves. Only Jesus can do it. It's a work that takes place not even on the outside. It's a work that takes place where? On the heart. We should be praying tonight, Lord, give me a new heart. Because we can make all the changes on the outside and clean everything up. But if these hearts are not cleaned up, will we be ready to stand? The Bible says, who shall stand? Those that have clean hands and a pure heart. I want a new heart. What do you say? I'm going to tell you something. The reason why the devil attacks us is because he's afraid of what can happen on this island. The reason why a devil will attack a young man is because he understands the power of young men. I believe that God has a young man here today that has a, spe God has a special work for. I believe God has a work for you. And I believe the devil's afraid that, you see, if we could walk with the devil, do you know what we could do for Jesus Christ? When we have some young men that will be willing to stand for Jesus, the devil's afraid of this. But I believe that some of them are in this room right here today. They're going to stay away with the world. There's nothing there for me. What I want to do is follow the man, the man, Christ Jesus. Listen, there's a man in the States called 50 Cent. You don't know about him in America, Samoa. You don't know who he is, do you? 50 Cent? Listen, 50 Cent doesn't know who you are. He wouldn't even give you a dime. But Jesus has given us his life. Jesus has died for us. Won't you live for him? My question tonight, what has the devil done for you to make you so loyal to him? We will listen and jam his music. We will play his videos. We will play his video games, his amusements. What has the devil done for us to make us so loyal to him? But Jesus has given everything. Jesus died for me. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I want to live for him. You can have the world, but give me Jesus. Is that your desire tonight? If that's your desire tonight, would you reverently kneel with me as we pray? Heavenly Father, the Day of Atonement is about to come to an end. We're in the final moments of this earth's history. The 6,000 years is almost reached, and the devil flatters himself that he's going to keep you in there until the time runs out. But he doesn't know that there's going to be an upset, that a revival and reformation is going to take place in the island of Samoa. That is even now beginning that youth and adults are going to wake up and stop playing games with God. We're going to see that it's time to clean up and stand up so that Jesus can finish his work in the most holy place on time. That he can judge the living on time. And when the sunny law is passed, a group will be prepared that passed the sunny law test. Honor the true God in the seven-day Sabbath. Receive the seal of the living God. Receive the latter rain. Give the loud cry. Bring the other sheep in many denominations who have never heard this message into the true church. Everyone who has ever named the name of Christ then can stand up. And then Michael will stand up, finish his work as priest before the 6,000 years, leave the sanctuary after the plagues fall, and crush the head of Satan. And Father, we have but just a few short months left. We're here. Please, dear God, if ever there was a time to wake up as now, please show us, dear Lord, to stop playing games with Jesus. 
I pause the prayer of this on here today that says, dear God, I want to stop playing games. I've been distracted, but not no more tonight. I've been a fool, but not no more tonight. Tonight, I want to stand for God. I don't care what other young people are doing. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. In fact, is there someone here tonight, some young man tonight, that will be courageous enough to say, dear God, I will follow Jesus. I want to see if there's some cowards or some people that are not afraid. I want to see the real Samoan uh, warrior spirit. If there's a young person that is willing to stand for Jesus, a young man for Christ, I want you just to raise your hand and say, I'm going to stand for Jesus, a young man. If you're a young man that says, I'm going to stand, just raise your hand. Just raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. I see some hands going up. Praise God. Are there some young women that say, dear God, tonight I want to be courageous to stand for you. Just raise your hand. Just raise your hand wherever you are. Are there some older women, some older men, some families tonight? Praise the Lord. Heavenly Father, you see those standing. You see those lifting their hands. If there's any hand that's not lifted tonight, I pray that you would agitate that soul until it makes a decision for Jesus. Father, very soon, all will wish that they knew you. But it will be too late. Thank you that tonight it's not too late. If there's one soul watching on the internet, one soul right here in this room, you feel the Holy Spirit talking to you. You may not make it home tonight. Raise your hand. You're saying, dear Jesus, I want to follow you. Father, you see the hands. Thank you. Save us. Bring us back out tomorrow night, we pray. Let nothing stop us. We see the devil is serious. Help us to show him that we're, mean, we, we're serious too. By your grace, bring us back tomorrow. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated for a silent moment of meditation. Are you happy you're here tonight? Did you learn anything? Do you want some more? Is the devil serious? Is the devil afraid? Should he be afraid? If we run to Jesus. Ask Jesus the question. Tonight, homework. Review and ask him, what's in my heart that needs to what? Come out. What's not in my heart that needs to? Come in. And I tell you, I asked God and God told me some things. The greatest thing that needs to come into our heart is Jesus. I want Jesus. What do you say? Amen. I'm going to be praying for you. The devil's afraid. Make it up in your mind. Nothing will stop you. What time? Six. Thirty-nine. Ten seconds? Five seconds. We have but a little time left. Let's pray for the meetings. Let's pray for each other. You know that it's not possible. It's possible that some may leave and never come back. What's more important than this? Is our work, work more important than this? Is our jobs more important than this? Is our school more important than this? Nothing is. Jesus is the most important thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I never forget a man, we, we remember during a meeting, I remember a man was going to one of the meetings like this. He had come night after night. He was in the world. He, he, he had been a seven Adventist, but he went to the world. And as he went into the world, he got, he got involved in drugs and being gangsters and into, into all the wrong lifestyle. But he came back to God. And this particular day, he had come back to God and he said, look, I'm giving my, by my life back to you forever. He was leaving a meeting like this. He got into the car. And he jumps in. He had one of those uh, like Corvette type cars, race cars. He jumped into the car, and the highway is not like here. You see, in American Samoa, you, you, you can only drive what, 25, 30? Now, I know some of you driving 30, <laughs> 40. But he, he can only drive 20. Uh, but there in the state, you drive 65, 70. He's on an interstate in California, interstate. I mean, he's, he's opening up. He's going 85, 90. What happened was he was going home. He was just minding his business. But somebody who knew him knew that he liked to race cars when he was in the world. His friend saw him and said, ah, you're a seven Adventist? <laughs> he got into the car, boom, the friend took off, boom. 
gunned it. 900, man gone. All of a sudden, the man, he's thinking, and he's thinking, should I do it or should I not? He guns it. 75, 80. He passes the boy that, was in, uh, that, that passed him. 90, 95, 100. He's smiling now. He's there. He lost control of the car. Ran into one of these big vehicles on the side of the road. Crushed the car. The boy died instantly. Do you think that we should be mindful how we are when we leave church, yes or no? Do you think we should be careless when we leave? We may not make it home. We may not make it back tomorrow. Whatever we do, we need to do tonight. Before you sleep tonight, you better make it right with Jesus. Amen? May God bless you. You may consider yourself dismissed. I'll see you tomorrow night at 639. God bless you.